It just hadn't been the Senate porch this no. summer. Like they could true. be waterlogged too. The ones that are turning mm -hmm. yellow or little yellow, they could be waterlogged. Well, because that's in a hanging basket, you know, three types of green. So what can happen too is if you just get a flush of water, uh -huh. like a pot or something, is you're reaching out the nutrients. So that would be the sense that they can't be there. I can tell this is going to be a great lecture. I'm going to learn lots. Uh, I know. I think it's the summer. I think it's not you. It's the summer. Oh, yeah. You'll get, you'll get all sorts of questions. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have a good time. I can tell. <laughs> yes. Do you need anything to throw? I have paper. <laughs> Series. This event is sponsored by Summer Sessions as well as the UAF Geophysical Institute. Please silence your cell phones. I checked last time I, I was there. Just um, if you need the restrooms, they're all the way down the hallway to the left next to the exit sign. Tomorrow night, we have Susan Grace at Music in the Gardens at Georgetown Botanical Gardens. 7 p.m. rain or shine. We'll be there. We hope to see you there. Next week, Magical Mondays will be featuring a painting class for the kids. 
And Healthy Living Tuesdays will be a lecture on nutrition. If you want information sent directly to your email box, there's an email listserv sign up outside. There's also the tear-offs, and you can just remember if none of that appeals to you. Tonight, we are very honored to have Ms. Susan Wilson. She's with she's a farm director at Flipso Farm and Ecology Center, a nonprofit educational farm based out of Esther, Alaska. Her responsibilities as a farm director include implementation of the farmer training program, and we have an example of that right there. Uh, oversight of farm production and educational program planning, as well as many other responsibilities that I won't list because they were quite few. Susan has a BA degree in zoology from the University of California, Davis, and an MS degree in plant ecology from the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. She has 16 years of organic farming experience, working on several farms in California and Alaska. She is a co-founder of Calypso and has been the lead farmer since its founding in 2000. She's an enthusiastic advocate for local food and has worked extensively with other organizations and community leaders to forward sustainable ag agriculture in Alaska. Please join me in welcoming Susan. Thank you. Just give me one the lights on. Oh, sure. Thanks for coming. Um, I am Susan. I'm with Calypso Farm. And many of you, how many of you have heard of Calypso? Great. Uh, people from out of town, anyone? Everybody's from here? Okay. So we're an educational farm. And what I thought I'd do for this talk is basically just kind of take you through the season a little bit on the farm, talking about uh, partly about the production and what's happening through our, our intense, fairly short growing season, but then also intersperse that with our farmer training program, a little bit of our educational programs that are happening. Um, we have one of our farmer training program participants here tonight, that's Scott, so he'd probably be willing to answer some questions about what the program's like. Um, so what I'll do is, um, We'll just go through the slides and I'll leave plenty of time for questions um, so that you can ask more about the program or happy to answer any gardening questions. Um, and we'll start there. Go ahead and turn the lights off and then you can see the pictures better. Can this one. All right. So as all, since most of you are from here in Fairbanks, you realize that the the winter is our off season. It's a uh, it's part of one of the reasons we chose to farm and start this project here was so that because there is a distinct off season. It's a wonderful short intense growing season, but there's also downtime, which is kind of nice for rejuvenation. What you also all realize is that the spring here is very rapid return of the sunlight, and so the spring is what really marks the start of our the harvest season, our farm season. And what happens is, so we're located five miles up the old Nenana Highway, um, down the, the Parks Highway towards, towards Denali, and then up from the town of Esther. And we're located on a, a slope, a south-facing slope. And so the solar gain and solar exposure that we have in our field is, is enormous. So at this time of year, which is Usually April, um, beginning of April, we start seeing, you know, parts of the field. What we also have, and this is so where the growing is starting, mid-March, we have a seed starting house. So it's different from a greenhouse. It's insulated on the back wall and the sides. And then these, it's got these big south-facing windows, and they all were cast-offs from UAF these enormous, enormous windows. And in fact, the whole front of our building, I think, is three giant uh, glass panes. And then the rest is insulated. And then we have an oil drip stove to keep it warm. And the nice thing about this, we can do all of our seed starting without any electricity. So we don't need to use any grow lights at all. The entire room is flooded with lights. The device on the right is called a soil blocker. And for the last maybe seven years, we've been using all soil blocks for our starts. And you'll see a few other pictures where you can see, you'll see the trays of plants. What that allows us, it's kind of like an extruder, if you want to think of it that way. You get the soil really wet and kind of compressed, and then you use this to kind of press out blocks. And 
This, we have several different size blockers, but the one we use the most can fit 80 plants in a, in a wooden flat. So this means no plastic, which is nice, but it also means no uh, root bound. For those of you who are gardeners, I'm assuming that's many of you, you're probably familiar with the roots circling around the little plastic plugs. What happens with a soil block is the roots work their way out and they hit a little air barrier. It's called air pruning. And what happens is they stop, they go towards, and they hit the, the air on the side of this block, and then they just put off little side roots. And so you don't get a root bound situation. They still have a limited time that they want to live in that block. For us, we try to go for one month from seeding to planting. But they're just a healthier plant, and we're not dealing with piles and piles of plastic, which we love. So this is probably is also a familiar sight to all of you. Um, a u fairly unique thing about our farm is that we don't we use all, all surface runoff water. We don't have a well on the property, and the water that we use is all runoff. So this is looking down our driveway. And so for a few weeks, usually, in April, we are frantically catching, diverting, catching, chipping away, and at times making little boats and sailing them down the driveway to catch all of the water. We use, on most seasons, it's almost all of the water that we're going to be using for the whole growing season. This year is a huge exception. And that we have all kinds of well, we have the we have full ponds right now is usually when it's just a nail biter for us at the farm because our our catchment ponds have been pumped down, um, you know, almost to the bottom, and we're trying to just conserve any drop of water. And for the first time ever, any more rain, and we're going to be pumping water out of our ponds. They're full to the brim. So th what this is is a little uh, gravity-fed catchment pond. It's kind of at the we have a hairpin bend of our driveway, which um, and the driveway kind of acts as this that it dissects the watershed if you want to think of it that way on the slope. So all the, the snow melts is coming off down the driveway, channeling down, and we divert it even with some pipes. I mean we have done a lot of digging and we try to maximize the water into this little catchment pond, which I believe holds maybe thirty thousand gallons or so. And then we pump from this little pond up to our bigger ponds, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment. So meanwhile, what's also happening is our compost piles are starting to thaw out. We make our compost in the mid to late summer, and then it's, it, get, we, it finishes by the fall, and then it freezes. And so this time of year, it's thawing out. And, and little by little, and you can see the blocks there, um, we've got plants started. And we're really kind of shifting our energy towards the growing season, planning and whatnot. Um, myself and my husband, Tom, started Calypso Farm. We're the founders. But we had a volunteer who started with us that first year um, that we started doing programming. And she's still with us. And her name's Christy Shell. And anybody who's interacted with Calypso is probably also Matt Christie, and um, so she's essentially another founder, and Christy and I work together to do all the farming. And so her and I are the ones that are in here, and she actually is it, uh, has great attention to detail, which I don't have, so I have kind of like bigger picture planning. I can do all the numbers, and this year I said, you know, thank you for remembering that plants need to be taken care of, because I had not even thought about the watering, and meanwhile, she's taking care of everything, and... So what's also happening at this time of year, so this would be very end of April, is we're getting ready for the people that come and spend the season on the farm. And that is where I'll start just kind of interjecting about our farmer training program. So every year since we first started, we've had um, farm interns, kind of an apprenticeship program, where people would come and spend the season with us. We'd incorporate them into the farming. And the idea was we'd be growing new farmers and having help on the farm. And it worked great, and we did that starting in 2002 until 2010. And we would have one or two people. And many of those people stayed multiple years, sometimes as many as four and five years on the farm. But what was happening is they would say, I'm not sure if I want to start my own farm. I, this is fine, working here. And then what also was happening is we were getting floods of applicants for our very few positions. And 
some of them had worked on four and five farms already. And so I would ask them, well, how come you're not starting your own farm? And they'd say, I'm just not ready. I'm just not ready. And so we started asking more questions and realizing that there was a piece missing. Growing the food is one part, but actually gaining the confidence and the whole host of skills to be ready to start your own farm is another. And so that's what I'll describe a little more. And that's when we decided to create this farmer training program. And so we've had dozens of people as interns, and then now we're in our third year of doing a farmer training program, and we've, we'll, we will have had about 16 people um, you know, at the end of this season complete our farmer training program. And these people are a huge uh, range. Uh, right now, in the, in the last three years, the age range has been 17 to 44. Um, and we get people coming into the program for all different reasons. They share a common interest in wanting to learn to farm. Some are ready to start their own farm. And the gal with the bread, um, she had done a part of a season on a farm in California. She came here, and she was planning to do a few more internships, and she just said, you know, I'm going to go start my own farm. And so she has a farm called Muddy Feet Farm in um, just outside of the Twin Cities, and is doing wonderfully. So it's really inspiring. And then we've got people, um, the gal on the, on the right is a current farmer training program attendee, and she's been a professional in the nonprofit sector for years, and um, is now ready to make this transition in her life to starting a small scale farm. So people come to this for all different reasons. We've got people who are drawn for the, to the environmental education side of it and are, are wanting to start something similar to Calypso. We have people who are really piecing together their personal education. They've potentially you know, graduated from college, graduated from grad school, and are piecing together this part of their education, not necessarily sure how they're going to apply it. Again, we have people who are, have already been farming. Um, the fellow from Ghana, Africa, was here last summer. He was a farmer in Ghana, and he wanted to, to learn, but he also really wanted to learn about integrating education and youth into his farm. And all of these people, um, they really, they are what bring the life to the farm. It's this, we learn as much from them as I think they learn in the program, and it's just this really wonderful thing to be doing, and as an educational farm, it's been such a great niche because we do field trips, we do workshops, school gardens, we have this educational mission, and to be able to fully integrate that educational mission into the way that we run our farm has just been really nice. So I'll keep walking through the season and also in, um, incorporating the kinds of activities that the farmer training program covers. So basically folks get here, and we are thick in the greenhouse season and getting ready to plant. We have a, the seed starting house, but we also have a greenhouse with plastic, you know, typical kind of plastic, double wall of plastic with a little fan that plastic is years beyond needing re uh, replacement when we get there. We, as you can see, never have enough space. And so we've got trays on the ground. And as, as soon as we can start hardening off and planting out, we do. Our typical plant out date for the frost hardy um, crops is usually around May 10th, May 15th. So we really push the, the early start on some of those things. So one of the things, and it, this comes back to the, you know, what, what was holding people back from starting their own farms, is once a week we do a farm business planning class. It's a 20-week class, and we basically start with quality of life statement and trying to do like bigger picture, what do I want in my life? And then we work our way through everything from marketing, planning, to budgeting, and we take a four, four weeks of it to kind of work out a budget, and then also branding and marketing and crop rotation, all that kind of stuff. And that's, I mean, those topics can be real snoozers. And so one of the things that we do is just try to keep it as hands-on as possible. And um, we just spend two hours a week, you know, working on that. Starting, and starting even in the early season where we're really busy in the field, we still start building those kind of educational components in from the very start. So here you can see, this is probably um, the end of April. As soon as the snow starts to melt, if, uh, for those of you who have been to our place, 
Um, you probably can recognize those, those, we call them toe beds on the slopes. For those of you who haven't, our place is all terraced. And in between the terraces, we've built beds. And those are what thaw out first, which is nice. So we're direct seeding into what we call our toe beds here, just to get the first of the seeding into the field. So the spring garden looks rough. And I'm sure for those of you who are gardeners, it just kind of has this wrecked look. And basically, you've got to like reshape it back into life. And so what, we're do, what we do, and this would be a typical May, is we, we use a broad fork to loosen the soil. Um, and then we're adding compost. We're transplanting. We use drip, uh, drip tape. So we use gravity-fed, um, a gravity-fed drip system with tanks all uphill from the beds that we're watering. And little by little, we kind of reclaim the field. And one of the things that you can see on the, the slide with the poppy blooming there is as we're planting, one of uh, the one of our you know principles of growing. When people ask how do you grow. We like to just use the term, you know, we take ecological gardening. And so it could be, sometimes it's called biointensive. There's all these different names for it. But basically, we're just looking at creating as much of a natural, a natural system as possible. And you'll see that in some of the later pictures. There's one of our tanks. They're 2,500 gallon tanks that we have three of them that we use to irrigate from. A typical summer, we are watering out on the order of 5,000 gallons a day. And so that's why we're biting our nails by this time of year, waiting for the rains to come, because we've gone through our water supply. Um, this picture, this is one of our ponds. And um, I mean, it's, there, there's two big ponds. We have a third one. That after last summer, we had a real late start, but then we, we, had, we went through all of our water. And so we're actually, you know, have plans to build a third pond to get us through on a drier year. This year it seems crazy to thought of a third pond when we've got two that are just full to the brim. So the water's pumped up from the ponds up to the tanks. And then early season stuff we do cover. Like I said, we're planting mid-May, so we cover to protect them from frost and also just to create a little bit warmer climate inside those little tunnels. And those that's just remay, it's ag fabric, um, which is put over the beds to keep them warm. So meanwhile, what we're doing, most of the farm work for the farmer training folks is happening in the mornings. So we have a certain number of hours we're working in the morning, and then we've got all kinds of different topics and things that are happening, all farm related in the afternoon, whether it's building, doing some woodworking. That same, this same time of year, we also have field trips coming. We've got 1,500 to 2,000 kids that come each year to explore the farm for on farm field trips. And we have about 20 to 25 farm docents. If anybody is interested in becoming a farm docent, we have a great environmental educator who runs our field trips and she trains people up and then they, um, they work. And this is Maggie Billington, for any of you who, who might know Maggie, and she's been doing field trips on the farm for, I want to say, five or six years. And her specialty is the woods. She takes them up and shows them all kinds of things going on in the woods. We also get kids into the field when we can. This is a group of kids this year planting peas. Those peas are now just producing, which is great. And then this time of year also is shearing. And so we've got a little flock of Shetland sheep. And this is my husband Tom shearing in the spring. It's usually very end of April, early May that he gets our sheep shorn. And so then one of the things that we do with the farmer training folks is really walk them through the process from shearing to, to finished, you know, finished product. And so we keep a little flock book with samples of each of the different, different uh, wools. And we have a range of natural colors. And then we also um, teach spinning. And so everybody kind of learns. Um, get some little hands-on experience handling wool, you know, sheep and wolves to kind of the final product, whether it's this guy really wanted a pair of hunting mittens, like a, and he'd never knitted, never spun, and he did it. By the end of the season, he had flip-top mittens that he'd done himself, which was really cool. 
So we do have the, sh the sheep, and then we have a little flock of dairy goats. And the animal husbandry is also something that we build into the program, whether it's, um, well, this will just start milking soon here with this year's goat, but we usually have a milking doe and learn hoof trimming and basic animal care. Usually their lambing and kidding is happening when people first get there. And so all of this is happening, again, in the afternoons, and we kind of build it into the week. And then in the mornings, we're still still doing some seeding. You know, you can see the tomatoes are getting bigger. Our seed house, as the sun angle changed, it's designed to be perfect for the month of April, March, April, beginning of May. It is flooded with light. And as the sun angle gets higher, the, we need to kind of vacate that house. And we just keep tomatoes right in the front because the sun angle's higher and we don't need the insulated space anymore. So this is probably mid-May where you can see the tomatoes are in there, but you can see the shade. So she's got the, the south facing to her back. And then the building kind of just gets shaded. There's a good example of that, those big windows. And, and that's where we still are doing some seating, but the, the house is becoming more of a tomato house. And this is just to prove that we do have fun. <laughs> but a very posed photo there. Um, but basically, you can see this is where we've started to get. This is probably the beginning of June, where things are planted. And, um, and we have, at any given time, a number of volunteers who may, you know, who may be out there. That picture was probably a mix of farmer training programs, volunteers, visitors. So what we're also doing in June, we've just gotten the field in, is we do a little bit of birch bark harvesting off the property. And um, really simple birch bark projects. And again, myself, Tom, and Christy, we are not experts in all of these areas. So we have people from the community who come and, and will share their knowledge with people in the program. And one of the projects that we like to do are just these really simple birch bark um, knife sheaths. Same time that the birch bark is ready to peel is usually when the, the wild roses are blooming. So this is just another thing that we'll do is take an evening and pick a bunch of petals and make some rose petal jelly. And again, all of these activities are a great way to be connected to the seasons, but it also, these are all building on possible things for a small diversified farmer to, to do as part of their future farm, whether they're going to end up doing jams and jellies. And if they're never going to do jams and jellies, the process of learning it is just one more little bit of confidence building. Like, okay, I did that. I made rose petal jelly of all random things. Um, so there's kind of a look at the field. What happens once everything's planted, we've got two, um, two main fields. Um, we just call them the upper and the lower field, looking down. And basically, our, what start, we start shifting. We're doing cultivating the planting season comes to an end and we're just taking care taking care of the fields. Um, again, one thing that we try to do is we try to really create as biodiverse of a farm ecosystem as possible. So we've got some perennial and biennial flowers. We try to integrate, you, know, you can sort of see in this picture there's clover. We use, we don't, everybody, there's no one right way and that's something that we constantly are reminding people in our program. They're learning one method. We have a semi-wild sort of method in that we don't, do, there's something called clean cultivation where you just have no weeds, and we just don't do that. Um, what we do is we, we manage the weeds as best we can, and this year is an enormous challenge with all the, I mean, it is a year for the chickweed. And so typically we try to cultivate them when they're little, but we also allow all of our paths to be vegetated. We try to get what we want there, which is mostly New Zealand white clover, which is a non-invasive, low-growing clover. And you can see that kind of white sheen. That's all clover, which is great. We don't mind the dandelions in the path. We just try to keep the chickweed out. So we kind of decide how to manage our weeds. And so it's you know semi-wild sort of space. As you can see, we've got some perennial poppies, perennial flowers. And um, we, we experiment constantly with different types of companion cropping. One thing we've loved is planting the lettuces in front of the peas. That's been a great, you know, just a, a, a great simple companion cropping. Some of these things work really well, some of them don't. And we're just always trying new things. So midsummer, we've got 
if we keep building in, you know, different topics, small engine, um, you know, small engine kind of training. And again, some of these things we have enough time to really dig in deeper. Other things, it's a matter of just getting exposed to it. Um, that's just sort of a fun, like, and you know, for some people, it's just being like, okay, I'm going to crawl into this car and try to understand something about how it works. And these folks aren't going to become mechanics based on these classes, but so, for some people, it will spark an interest. And for other people, they'll be that much less afraid of it. Um, blacksmithing is something that we've got a fairly new blacksmith shop, which is just really, really fun. Again, learning how to bend hot metal is just a cool thing for some people. They may end up, this guy who lives in Ghana went ahead and got himself a forge. He, after he got back home, he, he was super excited about the blacksmithing and all of the things that he could make that he couldn't buy. And that's a great example of a skill that he learned, and at least got the start of, that he can carry further. For other people, um, they're just like, they may never blacksmith again, but they gained, again, that bit of confidence that realizing that they made their own, you know, nail or hook or, you know, whatever. Another thing that we do, and so harvest season really comes on, it kind of trickles in in June, and then by July, it's a big part of our week. Two days a week, we're really focused on harvest. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Kay Hackney, but she is a local yoga teacher, and she also teaches something called natural balance and alignment. And so she does a full six-week course through, it built into our farmer training program on um, how to bend. And a lot of it's about just having a, you know, keeping your back straight. But it's a little more than that. And so we're just so grateful to have Kay integrated into this program. And it's something that everyone in our program really talks a lot about. You can see this is Spencer, who's uh, worked with us. He was in a pre-farmer training program, but he stayed with us for three years or four years. And he's now farming in Haynes. And he's saving his back because he got to get in on some of the some of Kay's classes. Um, so harvest time is really fun, a great focus. And our food goes several places. One of the main ones is a CSA. So people pay at the beginning of the season and then they get a, whatever's ready that week, basically. And our CSA usually goes anywhere from 16 to 18 or 19 weeks. And we just do whatever we can do for the season. So that's the bulk of our, where our produce goes. Um, we have 75 families or so um, participating in our CSA. And we, can, we offer flower shares as well. She's got those flower buckets. Another place that our vegetables go are the local restaurants. The one that we really do the most business with is Lavelle's. And they've just been wonderful and really trying to work with us and build a relationship. And it's been really wonderful. So we also are really working with those chefs, talking to them twice a week. And we sell to several other restaurants as well. But Lavelle's is just a huge, um, huge customer, which we're so appreciative of. And then the other air place that we sell is the downtown market on Mondays. And we really um, encouraged the downtown association to start a market. We had been selling there for about five years, just like on the street corner. And at first, we felt like it was going to be great getting food into downtown. And we take food stamps. And we, you know, we work really hard on some of these food access issues. And it just, I think people, the first year, we were really excited. And then it just, we couldn't build the customers. I think one little truck with vegetables just wasn't enough. And so the downtown association agreed to start a market. And so that's on Mondays, 4 to 8. And so, and we have... Because we sell so much to our CSA and to restaurants, we don't have a lot. So it's perfect for us on our farm because we couldn't, probably couldn't keep up with the volume of the Tama Valley Farmers Market, which we hugely support. We just have never been able to build that into our marketing, and so this market's been great for us. So because we have things going three places any given harvest, we do a lot of pretty careful tracking, and you can kind of see the, the little notebook there our pick sheets are fairly complicated because we've got any given crop maybe going one of three places or all, three places. And so we, you know, that's something that we also, everybody kind of learns how to manage. Even on a small farm like ours, we have about two and a half acres in production. We send out a lot of produce um, every week. So just like I've been saying that part of this, like by integrating these different type of topics, some are more really clearly related to farming, and others are a little more tangential. 
but it's all about confidence building. And so we do some carving, get people comfortable with knives. Um, John Manthai, who's a good friend of ours, comes and teaches some carving skills and woodworking skills. And again, it's not totally about the spoon. The spoon carving is fun to do, but it's about learning how, how the grain of the wood works, learning how to carve. And again, some people may take this much further. Some people may never carve another spoon. But it's a pretty cool thing to have carved your own spoon. And again, it's that confidence building. Same thing, learning some of these woodworking tools um, that you, you, know, you just may never, and, and, you, know, you may deal with and want to deal with on your farm, or you may never again. And the whole idea is at the end of this five-month period, you're learning how to grow vegetables, but you're also just building that, like, I can do this kind of attitude, um, which is, and it's really fun for all of us to be dabbling in all these different, you know, different things. This is something that I think is a really important and can seem tangential also to farming, is building in some graphic designs and graphic design. And that's another thing for a small farmer to be able to have the confidence. Art is something that many people don't want to touch. They're afraid. They feel like they don't have the skills. I'm going to leave that to someone else. And so what we do is block printing a number of different kind of graphic art skills and just really encourage people. The gal who did this was so resistant. She was like, I am not an artist. She was a, uh, had just done a pre-vet program at Stanford and was just like, I don't do this. And she struggled with it and stared at that block print, for, or the block, empty block, for like an hour. And then did this awesome little goat print you know, that she was really proud of. And one of the things about this is some of these things are, we integrate so many different topics. And for some people, there's topics that they don't want to touch. We had a woman who was like, I will never own a chainsaw. I hate chainsaws. I don't want to ever use them. I don't want anything to do with it. And then she ended up you know, going, OK, I'll do the chainsaw class. And she was really proud of herself. She still may never own a chainsaw. But she, you know, she was just beaming, because I think a lot of it was she was scared of the chainsaw. And she, yeah, she literally may never use one. But and the same thing with this. You know, Claudia may never do another block print. But she was really proud of what she had done. And again, that's what a lot about being a small-scale farmer is, is about feeling that you can do it. So later in the summer, is everything's just really lush. And one of the things that we do are cut flowers. And so that's something that we really make sure we train everybody on, is bouquet making. And um, we also do events on the farm. So that's something that we're making bouquets for whether we have a wedding or a farm dinner or something like that. Um, and again, that's an area that some people are like, I can't touch that. And then they realize it's not that hard, and it's another earned income possibility for them on their farms. The fall also becomes our more intensive compost building time. And we do it all by hand. So that's another area. I mean, really, one of the things that's been a hallmark for us is good and bad. We've never had very much money to work with. so. We're having to make do and basically do, you know, create most of our own farm fertility, whatever, based on what we can do and make ourselves rather than buying because our budget's always so tight. So our, the bulk of our fertility on our farm is in the form of compost. So we just do these big piles and we make them in the fall and then they're, they thaw out and they're ready to go in the spring. Another thing that's just such a natural fit on a farm is food preservation. So we do four weeks of different types of food preservation, canning, fermenting, pickling, drying, you know, salt preparations, whatever. And again, some of these things we've done ourselves and feel really good about and feel like we have the skills to be able to share them. Others, we bring people in who've had more experience than we have. Um, and it's really something that, again, everybody enjoys and gets and then, actually, everything that we, that we make, um, that we preserve, we save to use in the spring the next year. Because for those of you who have a root cellar or preserved food, you know, we're able to eat up until like March or April, March, we're still eating a lot of stuff out of the root cellar. And it's really that little window before the next year's garden starts that you're the, 
leanest on local food. And so it's nice for our primary training program folks to have to be stocked up in everything that the, the, the people the year before preserved for them for the month of May before the, green, the new stuff comes on. So in the fall, again, we're plugging along on all these different topics, but the, the harvest, some days it's beautiful and other days it's hard. And that's another piece of farming is, you know, it's just not always fun, you know? There's times when you're just out there in the snow. Claudia looks happy, but... <laughs> and, you know, that's, I think, part of being able to do that in a group of people and um, helps. And there's, uh, you know, Scott, a couple months ago or something was out there. We were out there with freezing hands trying to trellis the peas in the rain, and that's just part of it as well. So this is... Again, the one nice thing about our short growing season is that people can really see the, the whole season in five months. So it's a really packed five months for all of us. And our growing season you know, starts a little earlier because we're planting in, May, in March. And then we're wrapped out of the, done out of the field in October. But to have this, the farmer training program folks have this intense five month season, they actually see putting away, uh, putting all the crops in their root cellar, finishing the last final harvest, putting, draining and putting the hoses away. And so it's a really, you know, it's an exciting thing to be able to have these people go on and start their own farms, of which we are, have just a growing list of people who have either been interns or now in our farmer training program who have started farms in different places, which is just really exciting. So in addition to the ad adults, and young adults and uh, people of all ages that participate in this program, it's also just like one of the most important aspects of growing new farmers, which we need in our communities, um, is exposing youth. And that's something that's been from in the center of what we've done since 2000 when we found, were founded, is educating youth has been really important. And so again, we have kids that come up to the farm and for them a lot of a lot of this is just about familiarity. It's about realizing that milk comes from the goat or the cow. It's about picking a carrot and realizing it comes out of the ground, you know? And it's about just getting more comfortable. And so we do that both through field trips. And then the other thing that we do is a network of school gardens in town. And this is a program that's really challenging for us. We're a really small organization. And we've got five school gardens that we completely maintain. And it's really hard. But it's also so rewarding because what this does is it doesn't only reach the you know, kids who are able to come up for a two-hour field trip. This, these are gardens that are happening on these kids' school grounds. And so it's one thing, and it's wonderful for them to come up and visit Calypso Farm and pick things out of the field or make a pizza It's really fun super popular field trip that we do is this wood-fired pizza thing. But it's still a little bit another world. I mean, these kids have driven, have ridden 20 minutes on a bus, and they just look around and go, where do you guys, like, where do you go get your groceries? Or they just are, it seems so foreign, I think, for a lot of kids. And so by bringing that closer to home for them and having gardens that are happening on their own school grounds is just one step closer. So these are youth that have, a, you know, will have a better understanding of where their food comes from. We run a number of different kind of youth programs in the summer at these school gardens. And um, we're doing some younger camps this summer and we're constantly trying to figure out how to do, you know, how to engage kids in different ways and how to figure out how to fund it. And, Whatnot, but a really important part is having kids learn and be empowered to grow their own food. And then in this case, they're t the programs we've done with the older kids, they're taking food home weekly and they're selling it to the community. And that's been a really, you know, it's, it's a really important part of um, the aspect of growing farmers. So basically we get to, we grow food and have fun with that. And then as we do as much as we can to... Um, to make everybody feel comfortable. And a lot of what happens in our school garden programs also is it's not like, come, we're going to teach you all about all the ins and outs of growing food. A lot of it is like, let me show you how easy this is. And it's again, it's about building the confidence so that we can grow a next generation of people that's, uh, that are 
familiar, comfortable, and able to be our food producers. I think that's my last slide. There we go. So I'm happy to take questions. And So I'm happy to answer any questions. They live on the farm. It's really rustic accommodations. And this year I've been like, I'm sorry, because it's so rainy. It's usually a pretty easy summer to live outside. I mean, not that they're totally living outside. It's really rustic little cabins. And so I try to, I don't know, Scott, if I, ta if I explain well enough ahead of time, like, how rustic it is. I try in the write-up to be like, essentially you're camping. Yeah. Because they're really simple little cabins. And no one's too surprised. Well, we well. What do you what do you think, Scott? I kind of expected the worst, and I'm pretty <laughs> <Good>. happy. <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's what I'm trying to go for with all of our PR is just like because they're really rustic. They're un uninsulated, teeny little cabins, and I meant to put a picture of one of them in there. I didn't. Not not yours. No, we no. Christy, we still have Christy's yurt on the property and another little yurt, but. Um, it's a little cabin. They're little cabins, but um, 
It's super rustic. And then a shared kitchen. I should have put those pictures in there. And the kitchen's pretty nice. We keep it totally stocked with bulk food and then veggies and stuff. So I think people eat pretty well. You know? Yeah. No. Um, um, just to follow up on, what do you think is the biggest uh, conundrum for someone wanting to be a farmer? I mean, you know that they're coming with skills. They know how plants work. They know about composting. Is it a capital expense? I think it's the, I mean, I feel like it's the business running the business aspect and that's only because there is a very narrow profit margin in farming and so um, you have to pay really close attention to money in money out to make sure you go into debt I think the other one is probably capital startup costs that that slows people down and there's a number of options and that's something we go through you know with folks but I think it's like it's a it's still a struggle to be able to make a living and meet your things like with things like healthcare costs and education things like that I think it's difficult and but it's not impossible and so that's why we spend so much time in the business planning part and we just work the numbers talk about pricing and a lot of farmers aren't solid business people you don't have that background I mean you really need to have, be kind of a jack-of-all-trades and so I think that's the hardest. Yeah. I got to hear a few minutes late just when you were talking about water. And uh, I, I can't remember the figure you gave, how much you use in a season. In a season, I, I mean, we're using 5,000 gallons a day when it's really hot. And this is on two and a half acres. And drip. So, and we're watching it like a hawk, you know? So um, I would say, our, we probably, on a dry summer, we'd probably go through 80 or 90,000 gallons. It's fairly conservative, you know, and I mean, really, once those plants are established, we get to the point where you watch your pond level go down and then you just walk the fields going, you're doing fine, you don't need any water, you know? <laughs> and so and we really start kind of, we water a lot less once they get established. Do you ever have to haul it supplement? No, we haven't, and that's why we're building a third catchment pond. We have had a relationship in the past, and we we haven't in recent years, but we have had a relationship with the Esther Volunteer Fire Department where they were training people on our driveway and dumping water into our pond. They could dump about two, two or 3,000 gallons at a time. And what's that? Sweet. Yeah. And then the idea is we're a water source for them in the Upper Old Nana so that people would know how to use it. And I just talked to the president of their board who was asking if we might want to renew and like more formalize that relationship where we keep that front pond you know they keep it full and we also draw off the other ponds so there's that water source for houses up the road because it's been tight I mean we've it's been one of the bigger stresses that we've had there's so many things that can be stressful farming water on our place is one of the biggest ones which is why a summer like this even though it's like I cannot believe how much it's raining it, it's there we aren't stressed about water <laughs> And that's a, you know that's a bonus because it is really a limiting factor for us. And on the follow up on, on the drip irrigation system, uh, what kind of head do you have? And do you, when you get to the end of the line with just gravity, right? Is it still enough or? Oh, it's great at the bottom. So we're doing top to bottom, and so we have not much. I'd say at the top, and I don't know all the PSI stuff, but um, for our top <laughs> terrace, we're probably only five or eight feet above and then but then we've got the head on the tank too so it probably takes us might take us to 10 feet above where we're watering and so those terraces you just and we're manually switching them so it's like we're switching lines it can take me all day I'll do other things but to water just the upper field it can take me all day I start in the morning because I'm leaving those top terraces on for longer because I've got slower pressure and they might be on for an hour, the top terraces. The bottom terrace might be on for 20 minutes to be fully watered. And because we've got this stair-steppy situation, we have five terraces in the upper field with a toe slope in between. So I'm switching one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, it's like nine different spots because it's all sloped and I want to make sure everything can get the water it needs. Yeah. I want to say thank you for Monday night market. Well, thank it's you. In the right place at the right time. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, I feel, and Downtown Association has done a wonderful, wonderful job. At this point, we try to help promote it, and we are there. We make a commitment to be there, and then we do our CSA drop, which helps bring people. But thank you. I'm really glad it's there. What altitude are you at? We're 14 to 15. Yeah. So we're we're cooler in the summer, yeah. warmer in the winter. Has the cold this summer affected your plans? Um, Tim Mowry called like two weeks ago to ask that question, and I I'm kind of glad that I didn't um, touch base with him. <laughs> you know, I called him back and he never called me back because um, I think I would have said no a couple weeks ago. But it is slowing everything down. I think by today I walked around going, you know, everything is growing more slowly. It looks fine. But also getting this kind of influx if so quickly of that amount of water is, even if you've got really strong organic matter in your soil, you just get a leaching. And we've got, we've got great uh, drainage, mm -hmm. but you're either getting saturation, which is not good because that's no air, or you're just getting a leaching of nutrients. And so everything looks fine, but it's not thriving. And so I'd say at this point it isn't as good, you know. It's and our, we are, we have a really nice growing season usually. And we realize in a summer like this how spoiled we are. We usually just have a lot of sunshine and well-timed rains, you know. But this, so it's it's everything's set back a little bit, but it's not terrible. So. Okay. I was just curious how you get your seeds. Like, do you work with people at the university to get seeds that? A little bit. We do some from here, and that's why I meant to, I forgot the seed saving pictures. We do a little bit of seed saving, um, and so we we do some of our own seeds, but I feel like we're just on such a steep learning curve on that. So we do some salad greens and a lot of flowers and things like that that we save ourselves. And then we right now use mostly smaller seed company, not necessarily smaller companies, but companies that are grow that are buying from smaller growers mostly in the Northeast because it's short season varieties. So I talked to a farmer from Maine and I said, oh, you know, we use all these same seed companies being in like the circumpolar north. And he just stopped and put his head down and he goes, that's sobering. I'm not, I don't think of myself as the circumpolar north. <laughs> but you are. <laughs> but it's very comparable. Very comparable. So that's kind of where, but the, the goal, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with Pingo Farms and Kurt Wald, he's a local seed grower. He's the only Alaskan grown seed producer. There's a couple other companies that are buying and packaging, which is not, not bad, but Kurt's growing his own seed. And so we use every seed of Kurt's that we can varieties that'll work for us too. And the university will find stuff, but they're bringing it in from outside. So, and the, you know, we get some university stuff, but not as much. Yeah, they're working with Kurt too. We all seem to have sustained a sort of community-wide depression this year, and it's been slow. And I'm wondering if you could explain that. The slow, it's the it's the lack of sun. That's what it is. It's slightly lower temperatures, and it's a lack of sunlight. We are spoiled because we have. I don't mean that. I mean oh. the, the the gardeners ourselves. We we were all slow getting off to a start this year, and oh. I, I wanted to know if you could explain that. The Last year I could explain that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it just seems to be all over the country. I thought it was just me, and then I started. Just got a slow start. start. Everybody that I know. <laughs> Everybody was slow. That. I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, we we like we were off to a good start, and then it just slowed down on us. So who knows? Who knows? I mean, my guess if I were had to just like guess on something like that, is it's because of last spring. Because all it takes is one year, and then that's your new normal. And so last year, we couldn't even think about planting till the first of June. So my guess is that you were just like, oh, I don't plant yet. Because what I felt like all spring was that I was ahead. And when I look back, we were just on time. We were not ahead. But I was just like, we're, we're ahead of the game. And we weren't. We were not ahead. It was we were a month ahead of last year, which was a you know crazy late start. So there's my guess. When when do you um, subscribe if you're going to get into the CSA program? You know, a great time to do it is like February March, 
but we usually are still taking signups right till the end of May. But we try to encourage people to sign up in February. And how much is it for the size of the family? There's, there's a, we have two sizes, and this, the larger size is, I think, 625, and then that's for the family share, and then the smaller one, I think, is 350 or 375, I think. But it might have changed. I don't have those right off the top of my head. And the way that we, what we do is we, we base that, we, you know, it's, it's based on originally, like, what is it going to take to really keep the farm running? So that's part of it. But what we also do is we watch really closely and make sure that by the end of the season, you're getting at least 20 or 30 percent more than you would get if you bought it at the farm stand. You know, so you're, we try to make sure you're still giving a good deal, best that we can. And some years we can really load you up. In other years, we can't as much. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. CSA is Community Supported Agriculture. Some people call it Community Shared Agriculture, and that's where people pay at the beginning of the season or make a commitment on a payment plan at the beginning of the season. And then every week, you just get a sh that, uh, that sh week's share of the harvest. So you just come pick it up. Yeah, so we do, uh, we have a farm pickup, and that tends to be just neighbors up on the old Nana. And then we have a Thursday Esther Park or a Monday downtown market pickup. And so most people are picking up the downtown market, probably two thirds. And a third pickup in Esther, and a few, like 10 people pick up at the farm. So. So is that easy for the farmers in training to kind of grasp as CSA? Scott? <laughs> yeah. Um. I'm familiar with CSA because my family would go through some farmers to get CSA shares. I, I would think the other thing that most people in our program really appreciate is that connection to their customers. Cool. And so they help write the note. They trade off writing the, we do a harvest note that says, here's what's in your shares and here's some suggested recipes. They come and help with the CSA pickup. I'd say it's something people really enjoy. And the other really nice aspect of CSA, aside from your cash flow, which is you know getting the money at the beginning of the season when your expenses are highest, is um, this feeling like you're just giving it. And that's what I love. I don't really enjoy selling vegetables piece by piece. Um, I always worry about the prices. It's just not my thing. And Christy's our saleswoman. But for me, I just like giving the food every week. And so these You've paid for it and invested in it, but I like that partnership and that feeling that it's not just about the value of the bunch of carrots. It's just being able to share what's growing on the field. So that that's what I really like, and other farmers like that too. So, yeah. Is there any place in town that has a surplus of hay stimulator? There are a couple. It just depends. Aged, yeah. There. There's a place called uh, Flat Mountain Ranch up on Gilmore Trail that she usually has a lot. But I could probably, I could give you a couple other sources. I mean, we've looked for a lot of different horse manure sources and looked at like who has a bobcat, who, you know, <laughs> tried to figure it out. We get most of ours from Seekins. This is bigger, it's, they have quarter horses and we have a dirt worker person who will use their, their big heavy loader. So it's kind of like a bigger scale, but you can usually find people who you can get manure from. Yeah. A friend and I garden at the community garden, which is really, really nice. It's also less. Now, in, in five years we've been there, we've put in about eight inches, six to eight inches of horse manure. We came through and put in a good eight inches of grass, which took us two seasons to get work through. Mm -hmm. This year, it's like we never put a piece of organic anything in that soil. Huh. Are there any ways? My suggestion would be to compost the horse manure and the grass, and that'll help. I mean, we put a lot of compost every year, and ours is all loose. And it's silt. It's windblown silt, pretty fine. And it's it makes pretty nice soil, but where are you putting in... It probably ends up being about six inches, six to eight inches a year of compost on top. We do it a lot, wheelbarrow by wheelbarrow. <laughs> so, yeah. And I only have 30 Yeah, so I'd say, some, I'd say compost. Just composting that manure might help, and composting the grass clippings, I think, would help. Yeah. 
Um, you showed that you grow a companion plant, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you have issues with pests, in particular lice. Where I'm from, we would make um, a kind of mixture of burning nettle and let it sit in water and mm -hmm. take this as a spray. Uh huh. Like a pepper. Day, but, so, but here no burning nettle growing in Alaska, at least here in Fairbanks. So do you do you have issues with pests and do you have any recommendations what to do about aphids? Aphids, so a aphids and root maggots and maybe cutworms are the there's very few pests that we have to deal with here. I think our hard freeze in the winter. We may start seeing more as things change and our winters become milder. Um, pests are moving, and so I would anticipate that we would start seeing more up here. So Aphids, we have a wonderful host of native insects that are aphid eaters because we have aphid naturally occurring aphids in the birch. And so um, invite those in, and the way to do that is flowers. And I really didn't go into that, but we grow tons of different kinds of flowers. And one thing that we've, we also watch, you know, we're watching, like, where are the hoverflies? If you know what those are, they look like a little bee. But they kind of fly like this, and they don't sting. And they, their larvae eat tons of aphids, more than ladybugs. Ladybugs are also really common. And so basically, we just try to get as many flowers as possible growing, and we watch which ones they particularly like. And something they love is cilantro flowers. And that's just something that, a simple thing that we notice. We grow all kinds, cut flowers, all kinds of it's all just to attract insects. So it's, I, my theory is just bring more of them in and then they'll balance each other out, which they tend to do. And so, but when we see one that's a huge attract, attractant, like the cilantro, I trialed it on one terrace. I planted like a dozen cilantros early and just let them go to flower. They get this tall. And all of mine right now are laying down because of the wind and the rain, but they'll pop back up or I'll stake them or something. But um, what we noticed was that terrace was just a buzz with insects. And so what we did this year is we just planted several trays, and we have cilantro in addition to all the other flowering plants. So that's one of our main deterrents of aphids, and we hardly ever have aphid problems. They're in the greenhouse is a more common aphid problem for gardeners here. And there's a type of tobacco that you can get from Kurt Wall that takes one tobacco plant, and it's really been working for us. Um, and they, I don't, Kurt said, I didn't believe, I, I was skeptical, but it, we have not have a, had aphids in the greenhouse since we've been plant, uh, growing one enormous tobacco plant every year in our greenhouse. So, and then there's root maggots. That's the other most common. We rotate our crops carefully, and we use a row cover over the things that the, that the root maggots go for. And also just knowing the life cycle of your pest. So the root maggots, they're done laying their eggs now. So you can take off any floating row cover that you have, but they're laying really heavily in June. So you want it battened down, your turnips, your radishes. And then we never grow anything in that family in the same place two years in a row, ever. We're really, that we're really diligent in our crop rotation just around that brassica family. That's the cabbage, cauliflower, radishes, whatnot. So it's usually just like know your pest, and then I think try to figure out how you can work with them because you're never going to get them out of there. So, you know, just kind of try to figure out how they can fit in the system. Yeah. I was wondering how uh, the CSA model, if you're more or less locked in, you're in, you're out, just rotating to different places, the same basic crops. How do you get around to introducing new crops, not necessarily new varieties, but existing crops, but trying something totally different, and just out of curiosity, what's on the horizon? Well, we have a semi-haphazard crop rotation, so we, so that allows us to add new stuff all the time. But so we, we, we diligently rotate our brassicas, and otherwise, thinking about weed management with the crop rotation spots, and because we don't have a clean cultivation, we don't get every weed out, we have spots to get away from us, and I just take really good notes and then say, okay, I'm not going to put carrots there. I'm going to put a brassica crop there that I can cultivate in the spring. On a typical year, we have a lot more cultivation time than we've had this year. So we're able to fit things in like that and move things around. And, so, and for us, like, in terms of what's on the horizon, we're always trying new things in little amounts, and we have, we'll have our favorite you know, thing that 
that we get excited about. And I mean, what we're also doing, and this has been coming, we uh, this has been coming a lot, like sort of hand in hand with all the work I've been doing on the farm business planning. Is we had been CSA only to start with, and so it was just like you get your CSA shareholders, you grow diversity, you keep a healthy farm ecosystem. And what happened was we couldn't. We didn't even advertise for our CSA. We'd fill up so fast, and so it just felt like um, an endless market. We we didn't even want to put the word out because we had too many people for the spaces. And then I don't know if you're familiar with Full Circle Farm. Not to just blame Full Circle, but they came in. They shipped stuff from Washington under a CSA model, and um, basically what happened. And we also really encouraged other farmers to start CSA, but the local farmers' numbers of shares are around like 200 max in this community, if that, in terms of share CSA shares available. Full Circle came in with like 1,500. In our community, it was just like, they had like 20 drop sites. The UAF is a huge distributor of their stuff. And it, it, what it did was, I mean, I, it was super frustrating at first, but then also it was like, wait, this is just reality. And so what I've learned with our farm, and I'm glad that that's happened because it forced us to diversify. And so with our farmer training program, it also forced us, we would be in a situation where we're like, I don't know, start a CSA, you just fill it up. Because we can't fill our CSA up anymore reliably. And no, none of the farmers can. They, I mean, they've, most of them will say, oh, it's fine, but they lowered their numbers from what their numbers were five years ago, every single one. And so... What it did is it forced us to think more, um, to be more creative. And it's critical for any new farmer to be able to, and so what's on the horizon is like, I'm telling these guys, you know, look at Martha Stewart or whatever. Like, look at whatever kind of pop culture thing. I mean, kale's big. The restaurants will buy kale because everyone's excited about kale, luckily for us right now. But watching for those kind of trends and saying, well, let's try that, you know, and also looking at what might be able to grow here that people say doesn't. Try it in little amounts, so you're not too big failures. But, you know, so we're always kind of going, oh, let's try this a little differently. We keep a little book that just says next year on it, which is one of the best things about farming. There's always a next year. And so we just have this next year folder where we're writing down stuff like that all the time. You know, today I was fighting, Scott and I both were fighting with this trellising, and I wrote went straight to the next year binder and went train, create, do better training on trellising <laughs> or whatever. But then also it might be, um, let's try this certain crop. You learn from other farmers too. Oh, they're getting a good early crop of X, Y, or Z, and then we can say next year let's try planting that earlier. So always something to try. Any other questions? No. You can choose. There's very few certifications anyway. Um, you, or you might choose, a farmer might choose to be organic certified if they feel like the market, that will give them an edge in the market. My opinion here in this community is that it doesn't matter, and so I don't think it's worth paying for. I have, have a other, I'm not against organic certification. I feel like it's great to have our food labeled, but I we choose what we call like first person certification as you know your customer and you can describe your growing techniques and you know there's there's movements towards you know better than organic or whatever kind of labels but there aren't any there may in future years be some gap certification that stands for good agricultural practices and that's a food safety issue and so that's something that we have a food safety plan and we watch and again just thinking about like what's coming is we watch those sort of trends and what other farms in other states are, are worrying and thinking about and regulation that may come. And that's the only one I know of that may come. And it's probably, at, for the foreseeable future, going to be really hard to enforce. Um, it's a good thing to be using good food safety practices. And so that's what we try to do so that we're ready if we need to be certified. Um, something that you mentioned about the water catchment system has me um, curious if there's any possible plan to uh, educate the general public community about catchment the, ben the benefits of, of snow 
snow water, uh, snow melt and rainwater catchment systems? You know, um, we've had. I'm finding it. I, I tried to um, convince a certain body of people, and I just ran right into a wall. And on the catchment? Yes. Just have no well, and then you'll <laughs> you'll yeah. want to catch. Oh. And the reason the reason that I'm talking about it is because the billing system of uh, sewage is that you are billed for not only what you use, what you draw out of the system, but you're also billed for that which runs off your property into the system, which then must be processed and treated. So I'm curious if there is any possible future plan to educate the public you know, one of the things, and some of our workshop topics will be based on people's inquiries like that. Like, hey, could you just do something on water catchment? There seems to, I know at the local farming conference that we have in the spring, they brought up somebody from Texas, all home scale water catchment, and it was really well attended. People were really interested. So that's something that, you know, you could think about trying to put the word out and doing at least a workshop on our scale. I can't. No, no, we would, we could do it. We could do a workshop. You know, we could, we could do a topic. Okay. I think there'd be a lot of people interested in. We're no experts, but we are desperately catching water, so that's made us decent at it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's. I use what I can. I catch what I can out of the drains. Yeah. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, the containers aren't big enough. Yeah, and that's and one of the. With these, this pile of buckets <laughs> and containers and stuff. Right now. Yeah, having some bigger. Con yeah, Greer Tank is here in town, and one thing that we've been able to do, they manufacture here. I hope, I think they're still doing it. And when they burn, or I don't know, somehow they have seconds in tanks, and so that's been where we've been able to get these bigger tanks. Is burnt. Or tank tanks. Would there be a possibility of have you, have you talked with uh, CCHRC about any kind of a dual? That's a great idea. We will. I'll I'll let Tom know, and we can we work with those guys. That's a great idea to do a just a joint workshop. Yeah, I'll look into it, and we should be able to offer something. I would love to see that. Oh, great! Thank you. So you talked about uh, what years and dry years. Do you have certain varieties? You know, this is great for dry, this is great for wet. And well, plant yeah. them both and hope one survives. That's exactly <laughs> what we do. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it also just changes year to year. And that the thing that we're really learning is as much as we take notes, um, it's so and it's so difficult when you've got that many crops, you think you're gonna remember. I mean, we this year are growing fifteen varieties of broccoli, all of which we've grown before. But um, we're doing them in these 20 plant blocks, and I'm trying desperately to take as many notes as possible because um, broccoli is a crop. There's so much variability, and I want to see what I'm going to learn is what does well in a wet year. But you got to do that each, you know, each year. And so, you know, we have certain. We just can see what things seem to do well when it's wet. Onions love this, like all this extra moisture. But everything is getting slowed down by the lack of sunshine. So, but I'd be happy to if there's certain. I mean, basically, plant both, <laughs> and then you know, the more diversity, the better, because then you'll be ready. I was wondering if you grow garlic. In my first year, I had some Siberian variety, mm -hmm. and I planted them in the fall as I would be at home in Germany. Yeah. But of course, everything. <laughs> they do. They can freeze those Siberian. So we've grown hardneck varieties of garlic. Uh -huh. um, one thing we're warmer up on the hill. We have really good success with garlic um, overwintering. We plant it in the fall, and you harvest it the next year. But it's expensive to get the seed garlic. So what happened for us is you invest a couple hundred bucks, and you get your garlic sent up in the fall, plant it all, and you've got a great crop of garlic. But either you plant a lot of that back. So, you know, and I also, my, I came from, I grew up in California. My brother's a California farmer. And so those crops that grow really well, well there and that grow marginally here are hard for me to get excited about. 
um, because you know he can yield eight pounds of garlic to one pound planted, or 10 pounds, or 12 pounds. He's rolling in garlic. You're doing well if you get three pounds to one pound you plant here. It's not, in that way, not commercially viable, but it is awesome to have your own garlic. So what we said is we're done paying two or $300 every fall. We kept doing it because I was so excited because it grew and it's delicious. But you just start doing the math. And so I said, that's it. We're going to do another $300 and then we're going to be planting our garlic back. And we did that for about five years. And then in that five years, we had a couple bad years and our garlic supply dwindled down and I was not going to shovel out the money again. So my brother grew some seed garlic for me and it worked pretty well. Um, and so that's where I'm at with it. I'm just trying to figure out the money. So do you cover then your garlic? We don't, but I have heard of home gardeners who are on lower elevations that will use, like, either if you cover it in straw, you're kind of inviting a nice home for voles. We have so many voles up here. So blue foam has been something that some people have used, and they felt like their germination rate in the spring has been better with a little bit of insulation. So I think it's worth it, but it's... Um, it's just a marginal crop. And usually the home gardeners are the ones that can do it the best because you can baby it. Um, whereas on a bigger scale, we just can't baby it. It's got to make it or not. So I bet if you play around with different forms of insulation you should, and different varieties, stick with hardneck, uh, Siberian, Russian. Um, the raised gardens are colder in the winter. That might actually be a negative. I think it would be a negative. So what you might want to do is, I don't know if you could either pile snow around you know, shovel snow around your box, insulate the out, wrap the outside of your box just for your garlic. It'll probably make a difference. They can freeze solid, but the really intense cold will will keep your germination down. The other thing is drainage in the spring is something that I notice the most is they just don't like to sit in wet soil. So the drier the year and the quicker the runoff, the better the garlic. So we do ours in we add bunch of compost in the fall, which we never do. We just make these big, fluffy, composty beds, and that's where the garlic does the best. So dry, the stuff that's going to dry out the fastest. Have you ever tried to grow hops? Uh, yeah, no, yes and no. I think there's a, stay light, a daylight problem here, but I'm not sure. I have a cousin in Fort St. John who grows great hops, and it's not quite as north, but it's still northern. So we've been, um, we have... I feel like we tried one year. We've definitely failed if we have tried. So I still, I think it's possible. And what I've heard is they'll grow like crazy and they won't flower for you. That's what I've heard. Did you grow outside or in the greenhouse? We, I can't even remember. So I don't even, I'm not even convinced. I feel like my husband tried to grow some hops in the greenhouse, but I can't remember. So it's worth, those are the kind of things, it's like there's this like folklore that you can't grow hops. And here I have like maybe a false memory of trying to grow it. And so I'd say try, try it, you know, and try some varieties. And because I feel like because I know it thrives in Fort St. John, it should here. So it might just be one of those things that everyone's telling each other you can't do it and no one's trying. Yeah, the reason I ask is the price of hops. It's a great value added, yeah. or a great product, like a side product for a farm. Of course, all of this is your own. Yeah. And uh, she wished your year is always next year in farm. And I'm thinking, starting next year, what kind of perennial would be a good start to get the farm going? Uh, Something my son and grandson would enjoy. Something they'd like rhubarb is a great one for here, really reliable. Um, there's some perennial herbs that are just fun because they come back, you know, with gusto, like chives. Kids love those. Sorrel, lemony, kids love those. They come back. These are all the really, really reliable ones. Chard, chives, sorrel. And then um, you can always play strawberries, right? They'll keep coming back. We're not a like, commercial strawberry grower in any way, but our strawberries come back every year, and they get smaller and smaller because we don't take care of them in the right way, I guess. But that's also fun for kids. If anyone else has any other suggestions of perennial. Um, what about peonies? Oh, heard, yeah. I've heard that Fairbanks is very favorable in it. Yeah, there's, there's some great flower varieties. 
Um, yeah, peonies are really popular with their mark. I've heard that they're going to start, the, I don't know if this is true, but I heard a rumor that, that uh, Fairbanks was going to start exporting peonies. There's a peony growers co-op. They're doing a lot of great, it's gotten a lot of people really excited about growing. And so they take four or five years to get established and they're fairly expensive. Do you have some? They're fun. They're beautiful. And so that's a fun. There's perennial flowers, columbines, yarrow, um, all kinds of perennial flowers. And it's just fun to have them come up in the spring. I also heard that cilantro, cilantro was supposed to be another Fairbanks cash crop. It could be. It's just like buyers. That's all. You know, I mean, you can grow a lot of cilantro here. It's just a matter of who's going to buy it, you know. So we have, we sell, we can sell like two or three pounds a week, which we do. It does, but also bolts, which is why all the insects like it. So we plant it successively, and then we do all right with cilantro. It's good. You plant it successively? Yeah, we just keep planting it because it bolts. Really? So we just plant, like we'll do our last seeding this week of a lot of things, spinach, cilantro, <laughs> dill, and there'll, well, there'll be some nice, like, fresh young stuff in the end of August. One of the suppliers, Kennecott, for peonies, um, mentioned that lilacs would have a long season as far as being a cut flower of the South commercially. Oh. Once again, you're into really long leaf times. Right, right. But put lilac on your list. <laughs> yeah, there's great flowers, a lot of great flowers. There's a really interesting... Um, poppies do well here. Yeah, there's some perennial poppies that are great. So, should we wrap it up? All right, one more question, and then we'll, I'll let you guys no, go. You can't, you can't, you can't cut the uh, pockets. <laughs> Any other questions, and we'll just we'll wrap it up. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. thank you, everybody, for attending. Oh, open house. go ahead. Open house. We've got our That's annual awesome. open house on the 27th, and it's just a free event, and you can come up to the farm anytime. Monday through Friday, and there's always friendly people that will like point you around. But in order to come, and so it's fine to do that. We don't have set tour times. If you call ahead of time, sometimes we can actually set up a time to walk you around. But it's pretty fun. There's enough people around to kind of point you. You can see the animals and walk the fields anytime. But the open house is that there's music and all kinds of activities, and we have the pizza uh, oven fired up. So it's on Sunday, the tw uh, 27th. It's the same day as the tour of farms. So we just decided to, which is a great thing to do. Uh, who, I don't know who promotes the tour of farms. Maybe uh, Fairbanks. He'll be in the newspaper. If you look up Fairbanks tour of farms, I've been on the internet. You'll find a list. So this same day, you could make a day of it and visit several farms and some buyers too. So afternoon, weekend up next. Next week, Discover Alaska lecturer will be Michael West on 50 years of earthquake science in Alaska. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and have a good evening. What's happening at the Georgia tomorrow? Tomorrow, Susan Grace. Oh, what? Susan Grace, Music in the Gardens. Oh, yeah. 7 p.m. <laughs> Yeah, that did. Oh, excellent. This is ours.
or a shuffle for a green. That year, oh, they did, they did. Oh, they did. Oh, they did. Oh, they So then, uh, uh, then I started um, talking about the system. So I'll get a little bit more thousand square foot. Hello? Yeah. And you just need to get some of these names. Awesome. And I couldn't, I couldn't see the so that so yeah. I mean, It's a trade off, but you know, obviously, I'll see something like that. I everybody can use that information. Yeah. Yeah. It's I want to get on my desk at the moment. And not going to be a year or two down the line. I'm going to get on my desk for a second. How much is going to cost? And this is how much is going to save you? Yeah, I was like, I like the idea of hiring a full time. It's awesome. You can acquire the thing. Yeah, yeah, and then also, we, we've got this, my website, and that whole number. I'm not online at home, so I'm just yeah, sketchy. Like, I'm just trying to get ideas. Yeah, it's it's like it's well, I'm going to take her. Uh, she's doing now. Yeah, 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 y
based on some of the injury from last year. <laughs> yeah, so we were just like, okay, we're just going to do more knife skills. That's why John did the knife skills and okay. all the bracing. Okay. And then you can talk, Tom can talk to him about why because he just wanted to do things. He's just been carving out people a little more comfortable with their knives. And Garrett's, so really Garrett's talked about it too. Oh, cool. So yeah, I'm going to get it on there. But yeah, I'll be like the other time. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It was thank wonderful. you. Great yeah. Everyone loved yeah. it. Yeah. It's good. Glad we had no backwards. Want free water? <laughs> it comes with water. <laughs> <laughs>